completely challenged by the lives of these men and what they went through. Watching it go, oh my god, that happened to a man. That moment just actually happened to a real guy. The greatest act of, of humanity is that of forgiveness and the understanding that whatever can rage in somebody else can rage in you. And the only way that we'll get past it collectively is through forgiveness. And that's what this film is about. David believes in this story, not as an opportunity to show violence uh, or show how brutal the camps were and leave it at that. I think he's interested in showing a film that is about redemption through suffering. What's important to me about this film is that there's some kind of understanding at the end of it, and there's some kind of peace towards each other comes out of this. It's very, very important that for me. That it is about reconciliation and it is about acceptance of each other. That's why I love the title of this film. I love to end all wars. What does it mean to love one's enemies? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? These are the questions that I faced in my prison camp. The answers changed my life forever. This film's the story of four buddies during World War II when they were captured by the Japanese in the Pacific Theater and made to build a railroad from uh, Thailand through Burma up going towards China and India for Japan. And it was under the worst of conditions. Uh, they weren't fed much. They were worked every day, seven days a week, till they were exhausted. And so there was a lot of disease, despair, hatred. And um, under these horrible conditions, these guys finally found a way out by starting to care for each other, by building a, a university, by starting an orchestra, by doing art classes. We dealt with the story of men who go through the pain and suffering are not able to escape, but they find maturity and uh, spiritual growth through facing the suffering and going through it. When all the British soldiers got captured in Singapore, those soldiers thought they weren't going to win the war because they had no contact with the outside world. For all they knew, the war was over and they had lost. This is what they had accepted was going to be the rest of their life. Trying to generate hope out of that, those were some very, very strong men. They didn't know when they walked into these camps, they didn't realize that two and a half years down the road, they would be disease-ridden, starved skeletons. They just walked into a camp, you know, and then this hell, this demonic behavior started to happen to them. But what we really are trying to capture here is the human element, of what these men went through, and to honor um, what they went through with, with the message of reconciliation and forgiveness, if we don't properly portray their suffering, then we cheapen the answer to that. The tortures that went on are just horrific. And at the end of that, to be able to say, I forgive you, is absolutely mind-blowing. There was a torture sequence where he was tied basically as if you were going to quarter someone. His legs were tied and spread apart, and his hands behind him were tied and spread apart, and he was stretched on the side of a hill with his head going downwards. And he was left there for four days with no food or water. The sun gets incredibly hot. And then the rains at night, which were because of the runoff down the hill, he couldn't fully breathe because the water was constantly invading him. You lay down in that position for an hour and you do one of the torture sequences. And then you imagine what it was like to do this for four days in that kind of heat and in that kind of rain. Uh, I remember we had the rain towers and two fire hoses, and literally he could not breathe. Uh, and, and he withstood that for four days. It's a very well written piece, you know, it is. It's very well thought out. Rarer than Ernest Campbell, Dusty, they're four very distinct and separate characters. If you look at the movie, there's, there's almost three strands. There's, there's Ernest's journey, and there's Dusty and Campbell, and Ernest 
Ernest deciding which is the right way to go. Dusty's character is all about is if you never forgive, you'll always end up with a part of yourself missing and a part of yourself not being whole. And Ernest is a character who he tries to encourage him to realize that faith can be a useful thing in an environment like that. Bobby's character, uh, Campbell, is a, a military man, a career soldier, and he hates these guards, and he hates being a prisoner, and he wants to kill them all and break out. Campbell wants an eye for an eye. He wants revenge, which is very understandable in that situation, actually. Go up to my boys, Ian. <laughs> Campbell loves him. Of course, when he's, he's standing there, when he, he gets shot, it's, it's just too much for him to take because he can't do anything about that. So as I was saying about Campbell being a, a tremendously loyal and honest man, that moment of seeing McLean die in front of his eyes is, is massive for him. What about you, sir? What are you going to do after the war? Start preparing for the next war. Lieutenant Colonel McLean is a a Scot, a professional soldier uh, from a very famous regiment. Uh, and with these old, old regiments, there's a huge history of tradition, of service above everything. In fact, the same as some of these Japanese people have. Service and duty, the same thing. They believe, although Maclean would never sanction the things that the Japanese carried out, basically their whole moral code is almost the same. There is one thing, duty. Come to the emperor, to them, to the crown, to us, but it's duty. And that is a great analogy of what happened with the Imperial Army during World War II, is that these people were so passionate about their principles. The, the cooler they were, the more dedicated they were to their emperor. And therefore that was built into them. These Japanese soldiers themselves were beaten in their boot camps. They'd just be rained down on it. And um, it was a part of uh, their training. And, and so by showing that, we were hoping to give a little bit of insight on the true conflict.伊藤の形で戦争を拒否していたし伊藤の形で人を大事にしようと思ってた伊藤は戦争をやめる方法として伊藤しかできない形を取ったとでも強制されてる嫌がることを表面には絶対出さないことを自分の中でたった一人で
And at this point, he's like a New Yorker. Anything I have to do to get through this, I will. Whoa, whoa, gentlemen. If you want charity, go to church. As for me, I'm bartering my way to happiness. So pony up with some cash. Anything you got, don't be shy. Line starts right here. And his transformation and his evolution through this piece is realizing that you can't survive as an island, but that you have to, you have to belong to something. You have to believe in something. Each one of these characters was certainly inspired, if not based on, a real character. But each one of these characters are certain, certainly have a story which is started from. Some of them are a hybrid, and some of them we've created um, a through line that, that helps us in a story plot that makes it a little bit more interesting to move forward further. But um, all in all, it's um, based on the real thing. A couple of these characters, while I was casting in London, I met. And I said, oh, I gotta write a part for them. So I literally sat down and wrote like Foxworth's character, played by Pip Torrance, and met this fabulous Shakespearean actor. And I was like, oh, I gotta have this guy in this film. Well, unfortunately, we don't have any Shakespeare. To die, to sleep, no more. And by a sleep, to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. It is a consummation devoutly to be wished. To die. To sleep. To sleep, a chance to dream. Aye, there's the rub, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil. We had about five rewrites done when I met the director, David Cunningham. I just knew he had the heart. He had the same excitement about the book that I had. There's two things that I, I know I, that I brought strongly to this picture, and, um, and that was understanding the spirit of this film. And the second is knowing how to film real life, and having been around the world doing documentaries and trying to capture culture, and capture issues. So my hope has been to simply create the environment in which the actors can do their thing and point them in the right direction. He's a great actor's director. Again, he'll, he'll, he knows when to spend the time with actors and when to push on because of constraints of, of budget and time and everything else. He's almost got a team approaching it as opposed to him having just to approach it himself, which is brilliant. There's no, you know, he's, he's got an ensemble. He's, um, he's talked to us all individually about everything. And he's a great guy to work with because he listens, you know, he'll listen to you, he'll kind of, even though he's lived with this for years, you know, and it is very much his baby, and he's obviously thought about every single word. He'll still listen to you and take what you've got to offer, and I think that's the sign of a really good director. The other aspect is the way we do capture it, and our director of photography, Greg Gardner, is truly brilliant. Together we've been able to make sure that the camera is there at the right time, but he just instinctively knows. And so what we do is we throw the scene out there, just like we're doing this afternoon. I put it together in such a way that feels real enough for, for actors to do their thing, but that it, the infrastructure is tight enough that we won't miss a moment. And if we can find that right balance, and fortunately we've been able to do that most of the time, um, we're able to get something really special. <laughs> David again has been has been true to his uh, his documentary background as well, and I think you see a lot of that in the sort of drama documentary style, and that can be again very very effective I think in a piece like this because it's getting in close, you know, which is what you want. I mean, if you if, if we're going to try and honour these men that were making this film, but then you have to try and show that pain. And I think David knows that, and he, I think he's sticking the camera in as close as he can get it at times. But uh, I think it also gives it a, a, a movement. The whole thing, I really, he, we're stuck in a camp. I think if you're putting it on legs all the time, it would be very, very static. I think he's got some great ideas about using a more fluid, handheld side for the the prisoner's point of view or the the prisoner's part, and a, a much more stoic, still feeling about the Japanese, the authority of the Japanese, the permanence of these people, and I think that that'll be very interesting to watch. Many of the actors 
had that type of style before. They're used to tripods with a wide shot, medium shot, close up, over the shoulder reversal, and so on. Um, and we've thrown that all out the window. And it allows them, once they understand that filmic language, um, they can really embrace it and celebrate it and then just add these really fresh and great moments that just come out of nowhere. And even the way we um, establish where we are in each environment, we don't start with some mammoth wide shot on many occasions, but we start from their perspective and build out. It seems to be really working, and I, and I trust that um, as all the pieces come together, we will see that feel and that thread really working. The design team have done a fantastic job in the camp as well, because it just it feels like that when you're in it. It's very bare, you know, it's, very, it's very minimal, but um, it, it, that's, that's I can imagine. imagine exactly how it would have been. So that helps a great deal. You know. We did this whole camp in four and a half weeks. The fences have no nails, every single joint is tied. This is what you call labor intensive. The camps were a minimum, camp was 4,000 men. It's the same construction exactly, the same design, but it's scaled way down to the size of our movie, basically. One of the toughest things was discovering how they made, how they worked the thatch. And I found the photographs and the research we had. So what the Japanese did is they manufactured them. And so we manufactured with the use of probably 250 to 300,000 leaves. We manufactured all this thatch. This tree is going to be a watchtower. It's going to be a 40 foot tall platform made from a natural tree. We're looking at something that's a pretty accurate a recreation of what was there, you know. These things did happen in places like this. So it was quite a powerful feeling. This, thank you, was not a basic entertainment. It was a picture to try to do something more than that. The trunk for me was an authenticity, which the script attempted to deal with. They made everything by themselves, how they struggled in the hospital to try and provide things. They'd get some bottles from somewhere, put it in um, the spokes of a bicycle wheel, it might uh, and so and separate the blood. This is our busiest day of the year. We have 200 POWs, guards, foot soldiers, and Thai slaves that have come here to be a part of a world changing event a motion picture to end all motion pictures. We usually get here at 6 o'clock and then we get our vouchers, turn them in, and get our wardrobe and then the makeup ladies make us all up. It's like being in the army. You know, this really reminds me of basic training. All right, let's go guys, one more time. Man, at ease. Remember, left into right, and brain shut. Bow, one, two, up. Like I was never really in real life in a POW camp, but it's interesting to see how you take a bunch of people and put them in an environment like that, and there's you, you develop friendships and relationships, you know, like in reading the book, it's like that's how they survive. It's going to be a long day. You're going to basically be standing here all day. And um, it may rain. If it's not raining, it'll be hot. If it's not hot, it's going to be cold. It just generally is going to suck. And I'm sorry about it. It's, it's not going to be easy. But in the end, I think it's going to be something you all be proud of doing. So thank you. And uh, stay skinny. <laughs> At least when, when the troops went into Europe, there was a semblance of, of a culture that they could identify with. Uh, here, uh, it, it's truly foreign, and I never really experienced that until we actually had to, there's a prayer and uh, an address that we have to make with the Japanese troops in Japanese. I didn't really fully respect the deep uh, crevice between our cultures until I actually had to try and say their language. It's an address that soldiers make to soldiers about the honor of being a soldier and that now you're a prisoner, that you respect and honor the people that are your captors. 
it was just amazing. Just something very simple like that really brought to me um, how far away from home these men were. The international aspect of uh, the film is something that comes naturally to my background. I, I was born in Europe and raised in Hawaii and um, have traveled to over 100 countries and done documentaries in over 40 countries and have spent a good part of my life in all kinds of cultures on every continent. And um, when we began this film, one of the key ingredients that I knew was going to make this dynamic was going and getting the real thing. We had Australians in here, we had the Brits in here, we had an American, we had Japanese, and all those from their own homeland bringing who they were into the film. We weren't trying to act like them, they were them. An international variety, which is true to the, the era and the piece of the story we're trying to tell, it just gives it a, a real flavour and um, everybody is mixed really well. We are a unit. It's quite strange actually. I'm quite a, a, a loner as a person generally on a, a set and a shoot. Um, but I found myself kind of getting roped into a lot of stuff, you know. And I've enjoyed it, I've enjoyed it a lot. And the level of respect that all the actors have for each other is, is so extraordinary to me uh, that it's, it's made it one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had just because there is no division. Somehow in this film and through this, through this project, there's no cultural division, there's no language division. By helping create that environment, we're going to get closer to what actually happened here. When we set up the reunion between Takashi Nagase and Ernest Gordon, my expectation was attention total on Ernest Gordon, on this incredible man who has spent a lifetime showing and expressing through his, his actions and his dedications of what forgiveness and reconciliation is about. When I got there, a whole other dimension came through for me, which I've really tried to put into this film, and that's really what was happening from the Japanese side and understanding why these gentle people with this incredible legacy of hospitality, articulation and intelligence and all, all these things that make up the wonderful traits of the Japanese, how could they get to this place? The brutality of the Japanese army, how could they come up with such mean ideas? I mean, they're playing with the prisoners and all, just uh, unthinkable. As we got to know Tagashi Nagase, and as, as he was weeping to Ernest Gordon, thanking him for, for not only forgiving him, but for helping his fellow wounded soldiers, I was just humbled by the pain and the, uh, the burden that the Japanese people have been carrying, um, especially the, the next generation, the second and third generation, who had nothing to do with it. <laughs> ま、my hope is that this film can go to the core of those wounds. And until we address the atrocities, because this is one of those things that has been swept under the carpet. It's been one of those subject matters um, that has been overshadowed by the horrific things the Nazis did. And until we deal with this, then the healing can't begin. I mean, there are a lot of things the Japanese government can do, but that comes afterwards. First, they have to admit the fact that they have done such bad things back then. And then we start to talk. Before then, we were not even on the same stage to talk about it. It's very difficult for Germans and young Japanese, you know, as it is for British people who committed some horrendous atrocities. I mean, we don't, we're not taught in school about uh, the number of people who were brutalized, tortured or killed, whatever, while we were building our empire. You know, it just doesn't happen. No country wants to examine the ghost of its past. So we are going in and we're showing exactly what happened, but our hope is, is that we're showing a balanced perspective. 
and I believe that's why we got these world-class Japanese actors, because they sense that spirit. I'm sorry, it's our government, they don't want to admit that they've done something wrong, but me, after the war generation, we, there are some things that we find it out and we know and then we want to do something and that is something I can do right now as an actor. So what's so important for us is not to miss both sides of the struggle. And that has been our attempt in telling this story. The capacity of the human spirit to encompass the most dreadful things and turn it into something positive under unbelievable circumstances, which makes one think, it, it makes you rethink your, your perspective through dreadful things, wonderful things can happen. Well, that's a question that's posed in the film by Ernest in his school, you know, that's a, a Plato's um, question. Right. What? is justice. And it's really, I suppose, just posing the question for people, you know, how would you, how would you deal with your time if you were ever faced with a situation as horrific as this? The movie is about forgiveness, and, and if, if they can forgive us for the things that we did wrong through that conflict, uh, then we can forgive those people for the things that they did wrong. Forgiveness has a place. In an, again, in a situation of unbelievable brutality, there, you know, there is room for forgiveness, there is room for uh, trying to understand it. There's an ultimate moment for me towards the end of the movie where a truckload of injured Japanese prisoners come in to the camp and the Japanese themselves don't want them anywhere near the place because Bushido Code, etc. There's a moment standing watching this horror where Ernest Ernest decides, no, this is I'm going to I'm going over to help these guys. I'm just gonna at least go over and give them some water. Try and patch up some of the wounds. I'm gonna give something to these guys because they're human beings at the end of the day. Ernest. Captain Gordon, I forbid you to give comfort and aid to the enemy. Major, those are wounded, dying human beings. They're no harm to us. one political answer to another, but someone's got to step out. And that's what Ernest Gordon and these men did here, which is incredibly fantastic. It's just mind-blowing. <laughs>